Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. I want to take you back today 160 years to July 4th, 1863, the evening of July 4th, 1863. The man pictured here, Sam Wilkeson, who was a war correspondent attached to the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac. He was with the New York Times and was with headquarters throughout the battle. He filed his report, the first news report that he wrote of the battle on that evening for Americans to read. And the report was published a couple of days later. On July 4th, when he finished that report, he did so with the certain knowledge that his son, Bayard Wilkeson, who was a lieutenant in the 4th U.S. Light Artillery, had suffered a mortal wound and died. So I want you to imagine this father picture here, knowing that his son was dead, the horrible discovery of his son's body was traumatizing, to say the very least, indescribable, unimaginable, any word that you want to put against it, the father losing a son, a family losing a loved son and brother. Still, he was able to set aside his feelings and his pain and his sorrow and his grief to finish his job, to be able to tell Americans what happened on the battlefield of Gettysburg. His story, what he wrote, is a masterpiece, really, of American journalism. And his story is, I should say, Sam's story is often lost because his son Bayard is the one, and, and fittingly so, his son Bayard really gets a lot of attention. So I want to tell you a little bit about Sam. He was born in 1817, came of age as a professional journalist during the Mexican War, and he really had a compelling personality. There's one report, in fact, it was in his obituary that I found that describes him as being aggressive, fearless, an incisive bearing, and a man who was reflected uh, with scarcely diminished intensity in his writing, practical and fervent in his patriotism. It's described as a characteristic trait of his family. And he also had the training of a newspaper man and the personal courage of a soldier. He was peculiarly fitted to be a war correspondent. When the war came in 1861, Sam becomes part of the Tribune, the New York Tribune Bureau in Washington, D.C. In March of 1862, he goes to the front with the Army of the Potomac as a war correspondent for the Tribune. He later switches to the Times, but in the spring of 1862, he's with the Tribune. It's a great little description of him at the Battle of Fair Oaks. It says, quote, he was present at the Battle of Fair Oaks, or Seven Pines, May 31st and June 1st, 1862. General Heintzelman says in his report, when I arrived on the field, I met Samuel Wilkeson, Esquire, the chief correspondent of the New York Tribune. I accepted his services as volunteer aide, and I wish to bear testimony to his gallantry and coolness during the battle. When the battle reinforcements arrived about 5 o'clock p.m. and our troops commenced to give way, he was conspicuous in the throng, aiding and rallying the men. So here you have a war correspondent and a journalist, Sam Wilkeson, volunteering in the moment to serve as an aide to a Union general and rallying the troops. Really does speak of his character. A little more than a year later at Gettysburg, now, as I mentioned a little moment ago, he's now with the New York Times war correspondent, and he writes this tremendous account of Gettysburg following the death of his son. I want to read it to you just because the story needs to be heard aloud, I think. So here we go. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Saturday night, July 4th, 1863. The Battle of Gettysburg. I am told that it commenced on the 1st of July, 
a mile north of town between two weak brigades of infantry and some doomed artillery and the whole force of the rebel enemy. Among other costs of this error was the death of Reynolds. Its value was priceless, however, though priceless was the young and the old blood with which it was bought. The error put us on the defensive and gave us the chance of position. From the moment that our artillery and infantry rolled back through the main street of Gettysburg and rolled out of the town to the circle of the eminence south of it, we were not to attack, but to be attacked. The risk, the difficulties, and the disadvantages of the coming battle were the enemies. Ours were the heights for artillery, ours the short inside lines for maneuvering and reinforcing, ours the cover of stone walls, fences, and the crest of hills. The ground upon which we were driven to accept battle was wonderfully favorable to us. A popular description of it would be to say that it was a form, an elongated and somewhat sharpened horseshoe with the toe to Gettysburg and the heel to the south. Lee's plan of battle was simple. He massed his troops on the east side of his shoe of the position and thudder, thundered on it obstinately to break it. The shelling of our batteries from the nearest overlooking hill and the unflinching courage and complete discipline of the Army of the Potomac repelled the attack. It was renewed at the point of the shoe, renewed desperately at the southwest heel, renewed on the western side with an effort consecrated to success by Ewell's earnest oaths, and on which the fate of the invasion of Pennsylvania was fully put at stake. Only a perfect infantry and an artillery educated in the midst of charges of hostile brigades could possibly have sustained this assault. Hancock's corps did sustain it and has covered itself with immortal honors by its constancy and courage. The total wreck of Cushing's battery, the list of its killed and wounded, the list of officers and men and horses Cowan sustained, and the marvelous outspread upon the board of death of dead soldiers and dead animals, of dead soldiers in blue and dead soldiers in gray, more marvelous to me than anything I have ever seen in war, are a ghostly and shocking testimony to the terrible fight of the Second Corps that none will gainsay. That Corps will ever have the distinction of breaking the pride and power of the rebel invasion. For such details as I have the heart for, the battle commenced at daylight on the side of the horseshoe position exactly opposite that which Ewell had sworn to crush through. Musketry preceded the rising of the sun. A thick wood veiled this fight, but out of its leafy darkness arose the smoke and the surging and the swelling of the fire. From intermittent to continuous and crushing, told of the wise tactics of the rebels of attacking in force and charging their troops. Seemingly, the attack of the day was to be made through that wood. The demonstration was protracted. It was absolutely preparative, but there was no artillery fire accompanying the musketry and shrewd officers in our Western Front mentioned with the gravity due to the tact that the rebels had felled trees at intervals upon the edge of the wood they occupied in face of our position. These were breastworks for the protection of artillerymen. Suddenly, and about 10 in the forenoon, the firing on the east side and everywhere about our lines ceased. A silence as of a deep sleep fell upon the field of battle. Our army cooked, ate, and slumbered. The rebel army moved 120 guns to the west and massed their Longstreet's Corps and Hill's Corps to hurl them upon the really weakest part of our entire position. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, in the shadow cast by the tiny farmhouse, farmhouse 16 by 20, which General Meade had made his headquarters, lay wearied staff officers and tired reporters 
There was not wanting to the peacefulness of the scene, the singing of a bird, which had a nest and a peach tree within the tiny yard of the whitewashed cottage. In the midst of its warbling, a shell screamed over the house, instantly followed by another and another, and in a moment the air was full of the most complete artillery prelude to an infantry battle that was ever exhibited. Every size and form of shell known to British and American gunnery shrieked, whirled, moaned, whistled, and wrathfully fluttered over our ground. As many as six in a second, constantly two in a second, bursting and screaming over and around the headquarters, made a very hell of fire that amazed the oldest officers. They burst in the yard, burst next to the fence on both sides, garnished us, usual with the hitched horses of aides and orderlies. The fastened animals reared and plunged with terror. Then one fell, then another. Sixteen lay dead and mangled before the fire ceased, still fastened by their halters, which gave the expression of being wickedly tied up to die painfully. These brute victims of a cruel war touched all hearts. Through the midst of the storm of screaming and exploding shells, an ambulance, driven by its frenzied conductor at full speed, presented to all of us the marvelous spectacle of a horse going rapidly on three legs. A hinder one had been shot off at the hawk. A shell tore up the little step of the headquarters cottage and ripped bags of oats as with a knife. Another soon carried off one of its two pillars. Very soon, a spherical case burst opposite the open door. Another ripped through the lower garret. The remaining pillar went almost immediately to the howl of a fixed shot that Whitworth must have made. During this fire, the horses 20 and 30 feet distant were receiving their death, and soldiers in federal blue were torn to pieces in the road and died with the peculiar yells that blend the extorted cry of pain with horror and despair. Not an orderly, not an ambulance, not a straggler was to be seen upon the plain, swept by this tempest of orchestral death, 30 minutes after it commenced. Were not 150 pieces of artillery trying to cut from the field every battery we had in position to resist their proposed infantry attack and to sweep away the slight defenses behind which our infantry were waiting? 40 minutes, 50 minutes, counted on watches that ran, oh, so languidly. Shells through the two lower rooms, a shell into the chimney that daringly did not explode. Shells in the yard, the air thicker and fuller and more deafening with the howling and whirring of these infernal missiles. The chief of staff struck, Seth Williams, love and respected through the army, separated from instant death by two inches of space, vertically measured an aide bored with a fragment of iron through the bone of the arm, another cut with exploded piece, and the time measured on the sluggish watches was one hour and forty minutes. Then there was a lull, and we knew that the rebel infantry was charging. And splendidly they did this work, the highest and severest test of the stuff that soldiers are made of. Hill's division, in line of battle, came first on the double quick, their muskets at right shoulder shift. Longstreet's came as a support at the usual distance with war cries and a savage insolence as yet untutored by defeat. They rushed in perfect order across the open field up to the muzzles of the guns which tore lanes through them as they came but they met men who were their equals in spirit and their superiors in tenacity. There never was better fighting since Thermopylae than was done yesterday by our infantry and artillery. The rebels were over our defenses. They had cleaned cannoneers and horses from one of the guns and were whirling it around to use upon us. The bayonet drove them back. But so hard-pressed was this brave infantry that at one time, from the exhaustion of their ammunition, 
every battery of the principal crest of the attacks was silent except Cowan's. His service of grape and canister was awful. It enabled our line, outnumbered two to one, first to bear back Longstreet's and then to charge upon him and take a great number of his men and himself prisoners. Strange sight, so terrible was our musketry and artillery fire that when Armistead's brigade was checked in its charge and stood reeling, all of its men dropped their muskets and crawled on their hands and knees underneath the stream of shot till close to our troops where they made signs of surrendering. They passed through our ranks, scarcely noticed, and slowly went down the slope to the road in the rear. Before they got there, the grand charge of Ewell, solemnly sworn to and carefully prepared, had failed. The rebels had retreated to their lines and opened anew the storm of shell and shot from their 120 guns. Those who remained at the riddled headquarters will never forget the crouching and dodging and running of the butternut-colored captives when they got under this, their friend's fire. It was appalling to as good soldiers, even as they were. What remains to say of the fight? It staggered surly on through the middle of the horseshoe on the west, grew big and angry on the heel at the southwest, lasted there till eight o'clock in the evening when the fighting Sixth Corps went joyously by as a reinforcement through the wood, bright with coffee pots on the fire. Rebel officers with whom I have conversed frankly admit that the result of the last two days has been most disastrous to their cause, which depended, they say, upon the success of Lee's attempt to transfer the seat of war from Virginia to the northern border states. A wounded rebel colonel told me that in the first and second day's fight, the rebel losses were between 10 and 11,000. Yesterday, they were greater still. In one part of the field, in a space not more than 20 feet in circumference, in front of General Gibbons's division, I counted seven dead rebels, three of whom are piled on top of each other and close by in a spot not more than 15 feet square lay 15 graybacks stretched in death. These were the adventurous spirits who, in the face of the horrible stream of canister, shell and musketry, sealed the fence wall in their attempt upon our batteries. Very large numbers of wounded were also strewn around, not to mention more who had crawled away or had been taken away. The field in front of the stone wall was literally covered with dead and wounded. A large proportion of them were rebels. Where our musketry and artillery took effect, they lay in swaths, as if mown down by a scythe. The field presented a horrible sight, such has never yet been witnessed during the war. Not less than 1,000 dead and wounded laid in a space of not less than four acres in extent, and that too, after numbers had crawled away to places of shelter. The enemy's infantry, saving a small force of sharpshooters, was wholly out of sight at daybreak on Saturday morning. There was talk on Friday night after the battle of organizing a column of pursuit. So there you have it. The report of Sam Wilkinson written, filed 160 years ago on this day, July 4th, 1863. Till the next time, we'll see you on the